Hello, everybody. Welcome to the RSA Conference Security Scholar Pitch Off. This is a test, test, one test. of my one, favorite two, events test, test. because we get to have. Actually, I'm missing a judge. He's coming back. <laughs> Okay, I can keep going. So the RSA conference has been uh, 33 years in existence, and it started by having people who came from academia and technology and uh, business all come together to try to solve hard problems. And so this particular event here is something that we've been trying to push for the last couple of years, where it's getting our security scholars to actually bring some of their research out to the audiences like yourselves. And so we're super grateful that you took time today. I have four amazing students that are gonna pitch their little hearts out. Uh, and then I have three amazing judges, which I'm gonna introduce you to in a minute, uh, who are, are industry leaders and have, are also very, very uh, thoughtful to give their time here. So to get us started, I just wanna uh, tell you a little bit about how it's gonna roll. This is a five minutes of pitching and then five minutes of Q&A. It will be timed. You will see me coming up and down, so it will be very quick and, uh, and, and brief in that moment. Um, so we're going to have to get started right now, but what I'd like to do first is as soon as my judge comes back, I'm going to start introducing the judges. So um, if you take a look up here at the screen, uh, we are fortunate enough to have Jamil Jaffer, who is right here in the front. Jamil is the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute. We have Ben Jun, who is the CEO of HVF Labs, which I just learned was hard, valuable fun. hard, valuable fun. And what he's doing is he's a startup incubator and he lets people, so if you are interested in becoming an entrepreneur, go see Ben afterwards. And then we have Helen Patton, who is a cybersecurity advisor at Cisco. All three are coming with industry expertise and they're gonna be able to share a little insights and ask a little hard questions. So we've got a jam-packed session here for you. So to get us started, um, I'm going to introduce our first security scholar from the University of Washington, Bothell, Marco Morrison, to provide his insight on the blueprint for aggressive cyber defense operations. Marco, come on up. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Morrison, and today I'd like to discuss cyber deception. Uh, when I was first researching the topic, I kept, re um, I wanted to explore its full breadth, but I kept on running into three recurring issues with current deception TTPs. The first issue is that they're too similar to one another. Pretty much every solution revolves around the honeypot or the canary token model. From what I've seen, this is the case for open and closed source development alike. The second issue is that it's too reactive. Uh, pretty much everything only really becomes useful once attacks on objectives or pivoting are taking place. Uh, this is, as we know, one small part of the modern cyber kill chain. Third issue is that they promote the passive mindset of waiting for an attacker to trap themselves. I really think that deception can be used for far more than just a means of detection and that we as defenders need to be able to interact and interfere with an attacker through every stage of an attack. So my question became, how do we make our deception more aggressive and innovative? And I will say that it's not all bad news. I found some tools to be very unique, so let's discuss a couple of them quickly. The first tool was Calry, which is an SSH honeypot that actually emulates a fake file system. When an attacker logs in and interacts with this SSH honeypot, they can interact with this fake file system just like normal SSH. The second tool is Portspoof, which is a service that emulates the signatures of other random services. So if a port spoofing machine is scanned with something like Nmap, uh, it appears as though the machine is running a ton of completely random services, which is a little bit actually funny to see. Now, one characteristic that I noticed was shared between these two is that they both denied or obfuscated information from an attacker, whether this is the legitimate file system or the legitimate services that are running on the computer. This sounded similar in function to counterintelligence, so I wanted to take a look into deception from an intelligence perspective, or into deception from an intelligence perspective. I found that deception is one of three information operations alongside counterintelligence and psychological operations, or PSYOPs. For the rest of the presentation, I'll be referring to what we know as cyber deception as cyber IO, or information operations, to avoid confusion. Now, why does this matter? I realize that the reason our TTPs are repetitive and passive is because the effect that they have is repetitive, and the means by which this effect is achieved is passive. Um, 
the way that the defender can combat this or the developer can combat this is by starting their development with a unique purpose or a goal or objective or effect and then working backwards along the IO branches. Uh, this way, the defender is forced to diversify the ways that they implement this deception uh, while staying focused along the goals of the IO branches. That was a lot of words. Uh, to kind of help visualize it, I created a framework to follow when you're creating a IO-based TTP. I'll also be demonstrating how I went through the process to create a deception tool of my own. To start, you need to define an attacker behavior that you want to exploit and the means by which you'll exploit it. This is very important to do first because the tool itself is arbitrary. The effect of the tool is what actually matters in your operational planning. For example, I know that, okay, 49% of attacks involve stolen credentials. This tells me that attackers trust and value stolen credentials. So I want to create fake, useless, junk creds for them to steal instead or alongside my real creds. So if they're used in a future attack, the attack could be mitigated or even possibly prevented. Additionally, some attributional information could be gained based on tracking those stolen creds to see who is distributing or using them online. Next, you want to kind of roughly define a implementation of how you would achieve this exploitation. For example, I know SQL often stores credentials, so I would create a SQL honeypot that not only allows the attacker to authenticate, again, like a normal honeypot, but also allows them to view and exfiltrate my junk data. At this point, you want to define the IO branches that your tool is going to follow. This, is, this will help you ask some important questions later on in the development process. Um, this example uh, baits the attacker into action, and it also introduces unreliability or uncertainty to their credential collection upon exfil. So I would classify it as a deception and a counterintelligence tool. At this point, there's some more questions to be answered based on those IO branches, but you can already see that we're working with a far more potent version of the overdone honeypot model. The key takeaway here is not necessarily the tool, but the process that I followed to create the tool. This framework serves as a means to help defenders align their thinking to the IO branches, and I know that with enough time and creativity, information operations will become an essential part of any organization's defensive philosophy. Thank you. So Marco, thanks uh, for your presentation. Um, I think it's interesting how you've connected the information operations, the sort of the OODA loop, right, and the IO cycle uh, to uh, the, the concept of cyber, de cyber deception and, and, and the way you've sort of taken us through one process by which you might create a capability or a tool or something that might make it harder for a attacker to succeed and actually might, 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 inf might undermine their operation. Talk to us about some more operational examples. Right, so how, if you're implementing this methodology you described, which I think is, is an interesting one, um, how else might a defender use this methodology to develop other innovative operations? Yeah, um, so that's actually another separate project from this. Um, well, th as you saw, we kind of focused more on deception and counterintelligence functions. Uh, the one that was kind of neglected was psychological operations, which is influencing an attacker's pre predisposition of some target. So. Uh, the way that I think about it is like how someone sees your brand. You know, do people see CrowdStrike as a strong EDR or something else of that effect? Uh, another way that psychological operations could be used at, for a defender is by changing the way that attackers perceive your IT infrastructure mm -hmm. through indirect means, so like social media. Um, imagine you have, let's say, a 50-person IT team and all of them have a Windows certification. That probably tells an attacker who's attentive that, hey, they have Windows in their back end or something along those lines. What if you had a tool that could spin up, I don't know, 50 fake social media accounts that all have Linux certifications instead? Mm. The IT team can do whatever they want and they don't have to change anything, but now an attacker who's looking for any scrap of information they can gain is going to have their predispositions influenced, right? They're not going to be exactly sure that your company is running Windows or Linux, or maybe both. Uh, so the idea is to introduce uncertainty and risk in the same way as we saw with the SQL. And what's different about your concept? I understand you have, different, you have a different paradigm for, for how, to, how to get to these answers, but what's different fundamentally about the concept from the way that we traditionally practice cyber deception or these operations? Well, from what I've seen, the, the way that we typically traditionally practice cyber deception and information operations is just with the same honeypot model. 
Um, if you look at different vendors, if you look in open source, there's this one list called the Awesome Honeypot Mod or the right. Awesome Honeypot list on GitHub, and it's I don't know hundreds of the same exact technique just with different protocols. Right? There's an FTP Honeypot. There's a, a SCADA Honeypot. There's a you know this and that different implementation of the same Honeypot over and over again. Or these companies that are trying to sell oh deception technology are really selling the canary token model where they yeah. have an artifact that the attacker wants to steal. Yeah. Um, last and the last question for me. Um, why is applying a methodology like this the way to get to more innovative operations as opposed to just come up with new ideas? Why, why, why does this methodology get us to better new ideas? Well, I think the way that it, it's intended to work is that you have to come up with the unique idea first before you even develop any de deception. So if you have the idea to bait an attacker into scanning some, your you know, your service or what have you, um, then you probably don't need to recreate, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, you can just look for an existing honeypot. Mm -hmm. Or if you have this complicated idea that has the same effect as a simpler idea, like Occam's razor, um, you know, you can probably just go with something else instead. So yeah. this is meant to take a lot of work out of making something completely new when you can just reuse an existing technology for the same effect. Yeah, Helen, Ben? Um, I, I think this is a really cool what impresses me is you've taken something which has a typical taxonomy, which is just honeypots that are gone this way, this way, and this way, and you've chosen to look at it in a very orthogonal way, which is this is the attack space, and these are the tools that we have to try to break through in that. I guess my question is, for those people in this room who are actually employing honeypots right now or using today's technology, uh, what advice would you have for them? I mean, short of fully adopting what you have, did, did you see any sort of gaps in how these things are currently being used or talked about? that would help them maybe deploy things better or think differently when they're making that choice? Yeah, um, that's a good question. To, to those of you that are currently employing honeypots, I would say keep doing it. Um, deception is a very unique field of defense. I would say that the way to improve your process is by defining, okay, what kinds of, and this leans a little bit more into the threat intel perspective, but what kinds of attackers are attacking me, right? What are their typical motivations? What are they stealing? What are they going after? What kind of paths are they taking? It's gonna be a little bit harder to define an attack path, but you can kind of look back in your environment and see, okay, previous attacks, what has been effective, what has not been effective, that is done by them. Um, so I would say just kind of putting honeypots and canary tokens haphazardly around is um, going to make them a little bit less effective. Instead, be intentional with how you deceive attackers. All right, well, we're gonna have to leave it here. Thank you, Marco, very much. Thank you, Cecilia. All right, I'd like to we'll welcome up Beth, Ch I'm gonna do it, Chowalski, Ch Chalikowski. Chukowski. Oh, I was close. Who's gonna be talking about the measuring the impact of cyber attack on air traffic control systems has on, what control system has to aerospace safety and air traffic controllers? All right, Beth, take it away. All right, hello. So this project kind of grew out of the fact that a lot of the systems and the technologies used by ATC today are inherently insecure. And so our goal with the project was to see what might happen if someone exploited the vulnerabilities that are in these systems. And we wanted to look specifically at what might happen to airspace safety and how this would affect uh, the workload and the stress for controllers themselves. So our approach for this was to work with the ATC department at Embry-Riddle, and we had about 30 different upper-level students participate in three different 30-minute simulated ATC scenarios. Our first scenario was nominal. We didn't introduce any kind of attack. We wanted to see what the baseline stress level was. We just wanted to kind of figure out what a daily operation would look like for each participant. And then moving into the second scenario, we introduced one of two cyber attacks. The first cyber attack we were simulating was a spoofing attack. So this created a scenario in which a real aircraft was flying in from one side of the airspace, and at the same time, an attacker was located somewhere else in the airspace, broadcasting the exact same flight data, call sign, all of the above. And because there's no uh, val sorry, validation or integrity checking in the systems used, for the controller, this would come across as that airplane like quite literally jumping across the screen the entire time. And then our second scenario that we were simulating was a replay attack. And so this kind of created the environment where an attacker had taken flight data from a previous day and was replaying that data of that previous flight over the controller's screens. So to the controller, this didn't look like there was any kind of issue going on. 
It simply was a completely non-responsive aircraft, so they couldn't talk to it, but it seemed to go on its normal path. Um, and so collecting data from this and to kind of get a better idea of what was happening during each scenario, we had participants fill out a task load index survey, and then we also observed each scenario to see if there were any major safety incidents like low altitude or collision alerts between aircraft. And we collected all of it and did our little bit of analysis to kind of come away with our big takeaways. So the first big takeaway was that when you introduce a cyber attack to air traffic control systems, there is a huge impact on airspace safety. In our nominal scenario, that number of average safety incidents, so like low altitude collision alerts, was maybe one to two in a 30 minute time span. And we were also working with students doing this, so we weren't very surprised or anything at all by this. And then when we introduced a cyber attack, that one to two average jumped to 14 and 16 in a 30 minute time frame. Our second big takeaway from it was talking with the controllers and seeing their responses because they noticed a huge impact on their stress and on their workload when they were introduced, when they had to face with a cyber attack. Um, and this was a big thing for them where they all explained that they were very, very stressed in handling the situation and the workload was so much higher in handling these situations because they have no prior training. They didn't know that this was a possible scenario for them to face. And so they were a lot more stressed just trying to figure out what to do, scrambling to find some kind of approach to maintain operations in the airspace, while also trying to figure out why is this airplane jumping back and forth on my screen right now. Um, and so looking into some further research, having that big takeaway from our controllers and our participants that they didn't know what to do and they wished they'd had some kind of training, future steps that I would like to pursue, at least with this project, is to look into ways that we can create training programs for ATC and give them at least some kind of process, some kind of procedure, so they know, oh, this is a cyber attack, this is what my next step should be, rather than having to scramble. And I think this might be a fun introduction, a fun move for this project, especially as it's interesting to try and find some kind of balance so that we can address this huge issue and provide training to them while also ensuring that we're not overwhelming participants or we're not overwhelming controllers and making them ultimately responsible for responding and mitigating any kind of cyber attack. Um, so that's kind of just a brief, very quick summary of the research. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. Sure. Hi, Beth. Thank you for this. Really super interesting. And as someone who's about to get on a plane. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yay. Um, I'm, I'm sort of curious, do you feel that the lack of, the loss of trust in their systems, one, was it foreseeable? And two, is it is it because it's a cyber attack that they lost their trust, or was it just that they couldn't rely on their technology anymore? And that could be a generic IT problem, not necessarily a cybersecurity problem. I think the, we predicted some kind of lack of trust. I was actually surprised that it wasn't a bigger difference in how much they trusted their equipment. But yeah. I do think it was just a general, they didn't trust their computers anymore. They didn't know what could happen with the computer system. Yeah. But they still trusted, like talking with the pilots, they still knew that they could confidently figure out what to do once they figured out what was happening. Okay. So from a, if the next step then is let's think about the kind of training we would want to give controllers to mitigate this kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think the training is specifically cybersecurity training around the kinds of threats that they may be fit, faced with? Or do you think the training is more on the recovery side of that equation, which is what are the manual processes you may need to follow? What are the, what are the questions you need to ask your pilots and so forth? Do you think it's a tech training issue or a human training issue? I think it would start with a tech training issue. That was one of the most interesting things we saw, especially with the replay attack, yeah. was that participants either handled it in two different ways. If they had been informed of the cyber attack, because we didn't tell them there was a cyber attack moving into the second one. Right. If they had been informed, they automatically just discounted it. They didn't think anything of it whatsoever. But if they didn't know it was an attack, then they would freak out and try to figure out what, what is going on right now. So okay. providing some kind of awareness of this is a possibility, this is an attack that might impact your system, yeah. and here's what it looks like, I think would be the, the biggest step to at least get controllers a little bit more comfortable in the environment. Okay. And in your scenarios, was there a singular, a singular simulated 
plane that was doing something weird or did you have multiple planes in their field of vision that were misbehaving? We just did one at a time in each okay. scenario. We didn't want to overwhelm too much and we also didn't really want to give away that it was a cyber attack. We yeah. wanted to see what would happen if it was just one little thing that was out of place. Yeah. And did they respond by being singularly focused on that one weird thing that was going on or were they able to continue to maintain relationships with the normal planes that were in their field of vision at the same time? It ended up being a lot of the safety incidents were the result of the controller focusing way too much on the one issue mm -hmm. and kind of ignoring all the other aircraft in the airspace. Okay. So is that, do you think then that becomes part of the training as well? Is, is how, to, how to balance what's going on in front of them so that they're not singularly focused on the weird stuff alone? I think so, yeah. definitely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I'm sort of obsessed with is seeing how people in other fields <clears throat> outside of computer security deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And one of these passions of mine is looking at nuclear power plant operations, aircraft carrier. There's like books on this and I hadn't really thought about aviation, but in all these situations, right, you can't like push the pause button while you need to figure out stuff. And there is this place where at some point you start having to mistrust what your instrumentation is giving you. Mm -hmm. um, the thing, the thing that kind of made me most interested, you know, excited was like understanding like the the basic hap what happens when there is a cyber breach is basically result number two, which is like everyone loses confidence in like every single thing in the dashboard of the entire organization, yeah. and and then you go in meetings where people are like, well at least this is true, and we're like, no, we don't even know if that's true, right? And then at that point everyone's paranoid, and you start looking for like ghosts. It's just like. We're watching this like thing degrade at every level. Mm -hmm. And so I love Helen's questions because they're basically like asking you similar like things. Um, the, 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 observ or the question I have, or maybe the suggestion I have is just to take a look at how some of these other fields approach. What I really like is you took a situation where people maybe commonly drill for something and you found a way to introduce something that's very new and very different. And what I think we found when we looked at this before was that there are certain fields that just focus on drilling that don't work as well. Um, I want to call it like firefighting because they just drill for that specific small 15 minute, 20, uh, half an hour window mm -hmm. with like nuclear power plant operations where they're looking at gauges and they're like, let's just assume that half these gauges are wrong, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I just think that you were able to cut to that like very, very quickly with these results in a way that would save me a lot of time if I just read this yeah. first. Well, thank you. I thought this was a really interesting study too and one of the things like having done a psychology degree they they also have one more um, like control group that didn't have any cybersecurity incident mm -hmm. and therefore then you can test the levels of adrenaline that each mm -hmm. of them had so that they compare but love it thank you very much Beth all right and now we are going to move on to Tennessee Tech University and with our next speaker and give me a second here because I have this down. It's Chitit. Yeah, Chitit Ariel from Tennessee Tech and he is here to talk about enhancing adversarial evasion strategies in Windows PE malware. And um, and I've given him some uh, some advice in the beginning to say that uh, he's doing some really interesting research from the adversary's point of view. And that's awesome. So we have to learn from our adversaries as well as from our, the people that have to defend them so they can defend better. All right, your Thanks, turn. Julia. So, uh, so the best way to defend our system is to know how attackers think. So in this work, I'm trying to create the adversarial malware sample that can bypass malware detectors. So machine learning has been everywhere. Since the stake is high, it's attracting more attackers, more, for more vulnerabilities at this time. And one kind of attack is the adversarial evasion attack, where uh, intentionally crafted noise is able to fool the mach machine learning model. So in the domain of malware detector, like the machine learning based malware detector are coming up right now. So it's uh, the creation of adversarial sample or the addition of what noise is not straightforward because uh, due to the strict semantic constraint that's imposed on the malware binary. So if we, if we just uh, make some random modifications, then the binary file might break and it may not work. 
So before I go deep down, I think there's one figure which is, of course, clearly not visible on, on, the, uh, on the end there. So the structure of the binary file is placed in such a way that it has a header containing the metadata, and it has the body which contains the actual content of the file. So the existing works to create the adversarial samples or to add the noise, what they did is they either added the noise at the end of the file or use the existing empty space in the binary file structure so that they won't alter the functionality of the file. So the goal of creating the adversarial sample or the adversarial malware is we want to uh, bypass through this machine learning based malware detector while still, uh, while still preserving the malicious functionality of that mal malware binary file. So uh, due to that problem, what, what we thought is we can come up with the more uh, flexible, a more stealth, and more, uh, uh, more effective adversarial creation approach. So for that, what we did, we introduced the empty space inside the malware binary. So we injected the code cave. So the code cave is just the empty space where we can inject the noise that can help us evade the machine learning based malware detectors. So we injected the code cave. However, injection of code cave or empty space in any random location, it's sure to break the file, functionality of that malware file. So in order to preserve that, we injected a code loader. So during the execution of malware, first the code loader will execute, which will erase our uh, code cave or the empty space so that the malware retains its original behavior or original malicious functionality. So after that, uh, we can easily uh, uh, optimize the perturbation on that empty region or code cave, and finally, that will give us the adversarial malware sample. To test our approach, we used two different end-to-end uh, -end malware detector, Malconv and Malconv2. Uh, they are pretty much the academic standard uh, for end-to-end -end static malware detection purpose, and we got the evasion, uh, we got the accuracy of 94% and 98% for those malware detectors, and we uh, implemented uh, two gradient-based uh, algorithms for uh, the optimization purpose, uh, gradient descent and fast gradient sign method. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if the images are clear, but we first started with a baseline of end attack, which got the evasion rate of 16% and 4% against two different approaches. While, uh, while testing with our approach by injecting a code cave and optimizing the perturbation, we find, found out in uh, .tx section, .data, and .r data, three different sections of the PE binary, we got to the evasion rate as high as 98%, which is almost the perfect evasion rate for each malware sample. So from this, we can easily see uh, it's very uh, easy to bypass the machine learning based malware detector on, once we get the sufficient access to that model. However, there are a few things that we noticed. One is uh, we can see uh, the rate, the evasion rate or the success rate depends upon where we inject the perturbation. So for one of our follow-up work, we use the explainability of the machine learning model to know or to, to know like which part of the malware does the malware detector gives the ma maximum emphasis to so that we can make, produce more efficient malware, uh, efficient perturbation. So I think by talking all this, I might be scaring you. I might be giving more power to the malware creator. So that's not my end goal. So my, go my end goal is to come up with a more diverse and a large data corpus, so that large malware samples, so that I can retrain the malware detectors to come up with a more robust malware detectors that can withstand these kind of adversarial attacks. So, so my goal is to understand what are the flaws on the current sets of our malware detectors that uses machine learning, and finally, uh, come up with a very robust malware detection system based on the learnings from this experiment. So that's all, thank you. So uh, first of all, by choosing to attack Windows PE, you've turned this from like a face palm moment to like fear, real fear. <laughs> because that's what my understanding is we used to recover from bad stuff on installs on Windows, right? So. Uh, kudos to you for choosing that vector, I guess. Um, as, you're, as you found, it sounds like you found a way to hide stuff by essentially increasing the size of the file to increase dead space. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about the technique you use to hide the data in that? Are you just shoving the code in there? Are you like encrypting it? Are you, did you build your own code loader? So, and yeah, what was I, the malware that you used for that? So, like I got the malware samples from the virus total, so they were not like the, because they, they give us like a malware from the couple of years before, so that's the malware sample that I used. So in terms of the code loader, I wrote my own uh, code loader, so like it's like I have a script that will generate a code, lo code loader for each sample, so the code loader needs to have the address of 
uh, my code cave because it needs to completely remove the code cave. So it's it's not a big, it's like 10, 12 lines of code in total. So it's embedded in the, at the end of dot text section, which is like where the code resides. So at the start of program, the, the entry point of program is changed to the code loader, so that code loader first executes. It completely removes uh, the empty space that I have injected or the perturbations they are injected, and after that, it uh, passes the flow to the original entry point of that malware file. But like you said, uh, one problem that I'm currently working on is on the obfuscated malware because most of the cases I do not have access to the entire malware file. I only have access to uh, uh, to the like the decoder part of, uh, if, if the malware is obfuscated, then I only have the access to the decoder of that malware. So that's the project I'm currently working on to see how it works uh, against, specifically against only the obfuscated malware. Okay. But you found that, just to make sure I say this back, you found that you could basically inject straight malware with a fairly naive loader yes. into space just by reorganizing the file. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> and um, the, 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 one, one of the problem like, with the Windows malware is like, they came back like 2000, and there are a lot of spaces on that PE structure. They are just, they are just for the compatibility purpose. So they want their files even to support the DOS operating system even right now. So those are the spaces which do not serve any purpose and still uh, the malware authors, they are like exploiting those regions to create the attacks. So based on your experience here, what do you think the state of the art can be in a detector? Because fundamentally these, these things don't actually execute the code. They're not, they're not putting in a, they're not, sandboxing it, they're just sort of looking at bytes to see if it's bad. Right? Yes. Um, and you've shown that it's actually pretty bad. Yes. So what's the best it can get? So, uh, like in terms of defenders, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. <laughs> so like there are a couple of things. So one thing, uh, one, one thing like because in uh, industry, I think uh, there are signatures that they verify. I haven't done anything with the modifications on the signature right now. I think signature still is a very much uh, dependable uh, way to sure. detect the malware. But one thing is the structure aware because most of the malware detectors, they are not aware of the structure of, of the malware file. Like let's say I'm throwing a Windows file, then if I'm doing modifications on the structure of the file, uh, because the writing is being done actually on the memory. So those kind of memory writings and those stuffs, I think, in many of the malware detectors, they pretty much track, track it down, and I have seen in few of the malware detectors, they don't track the memory writing because that's more extensive analysis when, when even uh, a malware is actively executing on the, on, the, on the program on your PC. So those are the things, I think, the memory writing, the structure aware uh, detector, and I think while talking about the machine learning side, I think we need to uh, make sure we have incorporated the adversarial samples, like the, at least the possible adversarial samples that we know right now uh, while creating the detector. What's the next step for you in all this? Sounds like there's a lot of things you could do from here. Yes, so um, I, uh, there are a few works that I'm currently uh, working on. So one work, uh, like I said earlier, I'm working on the obfuscated malware right, uh, right now to see how, how that uh, extrapolates to that domain. And the next work will be to work on the adversarial defense, like how I can defend, uh, defend against all these kinds of attacks and see how that performs compared to the industry, uh, some industry level uh, uh, malware detectors. So they are pretty much the next work, but I'm also looking into some other uh, malwares, uh, the Linux malwares and the Mac OS malwares, try to see uh, how, how that, uh, it, it can be like replicated or at least see how, how that works there. Yeah. Thank I, you. I wanna take a minute though and just ask our judges, because one of the things, it's very important to do adversarial research. So, um, and I'm very happy that you did this. Thank you. Um, I also just think that there has to be a small PA announcement because the RSA conference we never talked about zero days, but it's just a little bit about how vulnerability, vulnerability disclosure. So when you found this and when you did this, um, what was the next step for you? Were you able to share that research, like not just here with this audience, but also, um, What's, what's your next step? So actually, this work, like it's, it, I have, I have played, like it's, it's an archive right now. So I think I have got a lot of feedbacks uh, from the researchers, like uh, who are actively working on this domain. So one work, uh, like I said, I worked, uh, like the goal is, uh, like how to, how can to identify like what are the current existing limitations of our work and how, how can improve that work in the future. So I think this is a part of my PhD dissertation. So I'm building up 
towards the defense. So because my again the goal was uh, always to how to make the more robust def defense while while still stick, sticking to the malware specific domain because I did not want to come up with a more uh, generic approach to defend the system because there are ways to bypass which are very specific to the malware. So I guess I know while speaking about the malware, it sounds very cringe. It's, it does not sound so right, but a no, no, no. it's absolutely important. Yeah. I think you know Ben was hitting on it. It's, it, it's it's super important that we have researchers who are looking at it uh, who are on the good side, but making sure that they've disclosed it. Yes. Uh, because I know you kept saying it's bad, it's bad, but I, I, I feel like I had to do a PSA on this um, particular front. And do you guys have any other comments on that? That's good. I mean, part of the purpose of this work is to test the edge and exactly. understand there's, there's a layered defense in this. The signatures are the biggest source of defense we have. Yes. But there's a lot of the world that has stuff that signs, anybody will sign anything. And mm -hmm. uh, this is why this is so important. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank, you. thank you so thank much, you so much. For, for doing this. Great. All right, and we're coming to our final speaker today. Um, so Sika from the University of California, Berkeley, is going to be talking to us about an environmental impact. It's actually what I thought was, this was interesting, and Ben, I think you're going to like this. The effects of crypto mining malware on our environment. So take it away, Ansuv. Here you go. All right, thank you, Cecilia. All right, so good morning, everyone. So. Uh, my name is Ansip, of course, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about an interesting question that I posed back in November last year. So in RSA 2023, there was a uh, talk that actually occurred that went over the impact of cybersecurity breaches that had happened because of natural disasters. So they found that like there was an increase in organizations for having cyber attacks, especially when a natural disaster took out like... Uh, an operation center or whatnot because they're lacking the security resource that they need at that time. Mm -hmm. So it came to me thinking about the opposite effect. How does cyber actually affect the environment overall and understanding like is cybersecurity something that can do an environmental impact? So I was like, okay, I actually want to uh, challenge that question. And I took a specific focus on crypto mining malware. So for those of you who don't know, crypto mining malware is a malicious way of attempting to get a user and uh, an attacker basically downloads, uh, like makes the user download an implant and it uses hardware resources in order to um, make it uh, use CPU cyclage to allow the attacker to reap the benefit of making profit off of that person's computer. So I was like, okay, with this, uh, let's uh, do a, in, uh, a study on how much power consumption does that have versus how much average power consumption an IDS and IPS system is. So an IDS is an intrusion detection system, and IPS is an intrusion prevention system. So basically, uh, what I did was I created my own IDS and IPS that essentially took these malware data sets, the crypto mining malware data sets, and did pattern analysis to understand the opcodes. And I even made a machine learning module that used the RNN, which is recurring neural network. So I made it study those opcodes and produced sample opcodes that could be legitimate for cases of people in the future making these crypto mining malware sets and then feeding that into this IDS and IPS system that I had built and did an analysis off of that. So I ran the average malware sets that I found on a computer that I had, which was a MacBook Pro with a Windows VM, and it had a 60, it was around a 70 kilowatt hour uh, power charger. It was hitting around 60 kilowatts per hour versus the IDS and IPS system that I built uh, would have been around like, it was around 50, uh, 52 to be exact, but it was uh, a, a, a little bit less. But uh, the only reason why uh, the crypto mining wasn't like higher was because I wasn't doing it on a gaming rig, and I I couldn't uh, like I did this on my own budgeting, and I don't think my father would appreciate me increasing his electricity bill. So there's no way for me to like uh, get a. Uh, like more sophisticated machine to actually test this against. But as you can see, there was a, a slight difference. And there's also a control group. The control group was around 40 kilowatt hours. But basically in the study, I had shown that 
there was less power consumption usage between running uh, security defense mechanisms versus having been uh, susceptible to an attack. So why does this matter? So the actual, there was two reasons why I did this project overall. So one of them being was, I wanted to have an idea that why are we not trying to solve environmental problems with cybersecurity? It can be, there are some s environmental issues that I think can actually be solved with cybersecurity and you basically are killing two birds with one stone. I would want to do a uh, like proposal to like national security budgeting where they would want to have like security uh, budgeting and the EPA budgeting and I would think that they could combine two efforts into one, um, one proposal project that can solve an environmental and a cyber problem at the same time. So the other thing was I built this IDS and IPS system uh, and to go a little bit more detail of that, that was using a Windows kernel module that looked at processes and understood uh, its uh, binary opcodes and compared it against the malicious opcodes that uh, the malware would be having. And I built that because I wanted to have it show that small organizations like NGOs can actually uh, use open source software in order to uh, be able to solve their cybersecurity problems and still be able to make a difference. So that's pretty much overall my uh, study case. So thank you for listening. And so thank you for this. Uh, it's really fascinating to me, actually. Um, and I'd love you to run the RSA exhibit floor and talk to all the AI vendors and see what their thinking is around environmental impact. Just, just saying. Yeah, I um, like that idea. Can you give me some examples of where you think uh, cybersecurity could address an environmental problem? Yeah, so the one that I actually had thought about in the past was that uh, dams, for example. So if like dams do hydroelectric uh, purpose, They're, the purpose of a dam especially is that you can do, produce electricity through um, hydroelectric, like. Turbines. Yeah, so basically the turbines, yeah. So if someone were to take that out, you're actually, uh, first off, um, it's gonna affect uh, a certain area that, uh, that dam is uh, like producing. And that's not only an environmental problem, but uh, because now these, uh, now it's kind of like a domino effect. So these companies, like depending on the area that that dam is at, uh, if it's like very uh, criti like safety critical uh, uh, like locations, like maybe government centers or data warehouses, mm -hmm. they immediately have to come up with like other ways of getting power. So they're going to resort to generators that use like gas, petroleum and all that. So burning fossil fuels in the long run essentially. Okay. So that's like all in all like that's one main area but I know so this was actually a good that's a good question actually because this is something that I would have to like if I were to take this further I would want to look at um, the uh, what the budget proposals are for what they want to solve for the year, the fiscal year yeah. of an environmental and the cyber perspective, and then see if there's areas that they both cross and come up with an idea that says that using cyber, we can solve this environmental problem for right. that time. Right. So, How much of this is, uh, is specific to the fact that you're talking about crypto mining malware, and that's already an intense CPU and, and energy using process? Would this do you think these same results will be generalizable to the use of cybersecurity uh, capabilities against other forms of malware as well? And, and if so, why? So that's a good question. Yes, and the reason why is the following. So there's two types of malware specifically. So one of them is, so this spyware, I would not say actually. So spyware is basically where the you download something malicious and they're just taking pattern based off like trying to understand the user and trying to steal credentials or whatnot. Those are trying to be more subtle. And the reason why it's more subtle is because um, they wouldn't want you to be, they don't want you uh, trying to detect that someone's actually on the computer. They're trying to make it sure that they only view ver very certain things. But there are different types of malwares that uh, are very heavily intensive. I can give an example. So ransomware, for example. Ransomware is a type of thing that 
So you would want to download and it, as fast as possible encrypt everything. And that's very resource intensive mm. because you're gonna use strong encryption keys. You're gonna to be touching a lot of file handles on these, uh, on whatever the computer it's uh, attacking. And you wanna to try to download as much, like, not download, but try to encrypt as much as possible. So there are other types of malware, uh, like Trojan horses I know I've seen uh, have uh, the, si not Trojan horses, but Trojan malware uh, sets. Uh, uh, have the similar idea of basically being resource intensive. So I just want to make sure I have this right. So spend on cybersecurity is an ESG spend because I'm making I'm, ma I'm ultimately reducing power consumption in my environment if I if I can stop ransomware and stop crypto based malware and the like. Yeah, I could. Yeah. That all would right. Be a, that would great. be great. Tell all the CISOs. <laughs> is is it though that that security is an ESG spend in that spending on security means spending less on those things? Or is it a preventative measure to ensure that you don't have unintended spend on environmental issues that could have been prevented? Is it a preventative measure or is it an investment measure? I would say that's a, that's a good way of posing it. Um, so I would say in this case, it's an investment okay. because it honestly also depends on how a CISO views the way of implementing cybersecurity posture towards the organization. That's right. yeah, that's so right. I, would, I would have to understand what their viewpoints are and then introduce this idea of like, can you actually like use cyber? And did you think about the environment when you came up with your posture right. standards? So yeah. Terrific. It depends on that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. you know, today, I, what I really loved is all four of these students came from four different universities. They had different levels in their degrees, and they're all studying really different things. And I thought it was really special to see something in aerospace, something even at the environment. We had our vulnerability researcher, and somebody was doing something on national security and defense. So thank you all four. Can we give a big round of applause for the students? Can I also get a big round of applause for the amazing panelists? Thank you very much for prepping for this, and thank you for your excellent questions and giving guidance to the students. Another round of applause. <laughs>